Welcome back to Climate Change Perspectives. And Jane, I'd like to start off with you. And obviously your clients come to you for advice with regards to governance and ensuring that they, they understand the regulatory framework. I know that a lot of banks in South Africa have started to uh, neutralize their carbon mm, footprint. So true. it's pretty much in vogue right now. Do you find that corporates come to you and say, well, I want to be part of climate change and ensuring that we are doing the right thing? thing yeah. Or are they worried about the risks of not being part of the sustainable scenario yeah, going forward? It, it very much depends on the, the industry and the company. I work across all industries with, all, and with a range of companies. Um, and it depends where they are in, in their maturity of their development as well. Um, some people do look at it very much from a compliance point of view as to, to what they need to do, the bare minimum, and, and um, what's, what's coming down the track in that respect. Others are looking at, at strategic advantage, competitive advantage, and want to understand the, the broad sustainable development issues that impact their industry, um, how they should be responding to it, how they should be measuring sort of key performance indicators to measure. Um, and we're getting more and more clients beginning to talk about also actually understanding their value and real impact on society, uh, uh, society and the economy beyond sort of, you know, historical performance about how much carbon emitted or how much money spent on CSI. They're actually beginning to now look at, or, sorry, corporate social investment. They're now beginning to look at, by doing this, what have we achieved, what value have we added or what value have we detracted from it? And, and getting much more into strategic levels. So it's, it's, it's a combination of both. It depends with industry and the company. And do you find uh, mostly big corporate clients, of course, work yes, with it's, closely it's with you, not the smaller companies? Well, the smaller you. ones. Um, and it doesn't mean to say that they're not on, on getting onto the agenda, that they would perhaps use uh, smaller advisors, to be honest, because you know, we do deal mainly with, the, with mm -hmm. listed entities and the, uh, the larger government departments and public sector as well. But, um, but yeah, it's, it's, it's mainly the listed ones at the moment. Has King 3 ma actually made a difference? I mean, uh, in the reporting, can your sustainability, mm. if I may put it that way, a, a company's sustainability, be something that they can transfer to the to the balance sheet and that they can actually see the bottom line benefits? And is there, for example, tax incentives? Uh, Eleni just referred mm. to certain banks who are now trading their carbon. Uh, is yeah, that... Is no tax are those the sufficient options for it? I think, you know, the King 3 report has, has focused focus the mind on the embedding, the implementing. I mean, that's, that's the key thing. Um, and the reporting follows that. You can't, you can't report what you're not doing. Um, so it has focused the mind there. What we're seeing in terms of translating that into something meaningful, like you, you mentioned, sort of not quite getting onto the balance sheet yet, but we are beginning to pick up companies, not so much in South Africa, that are almost trying to monetize um, these impacts. Um, we worked with Puma in, in Europe around monetizing their envi environmental performance and actually just translating environmental issues, carbon supply chain issues into monetary value to at least make it comparable to, to the other performance indicators, mm -hmm. if you like. Gavin, it's great mm -hmm. to say that, you know, of, of course, the, the project that you're working on, uh, First Foot Mine, um, that you are embarking on new technology, you're thinking very differently when it comes yeah. to environmental mm -hmm. um, impacts and so forth. What about legacy issues? Mining has been around in, in, in South Africa for about 120 years and yeah. we hear that big mining companies will then sell a smaller uh, mine to a smaller company and then uh, we won't see the rehabilitation that should have occurred yeah. from the big mining house and then blame is shifted but the point is that someone needs to do something and allocate funds to it. Yeah. Give us an indication look, of what should be done in, in those kind of scenarios. Look, uh, I think from from the Beers point of view and, and more specifically the Beers Consolidated Mines operating in South Africa there's, there's a twofold approach to it. Yes, agreed, we do, we have legacy issues. And, and from an environmental point of view, we may not see the rehabilitation happening just yet, but we always need to go back and have a look at your community aspects as well. Don't forget certain mining towns and certain mines have created mine towns and they have created communities dependent on that specific mine. So, you know, you, you have your environmental impacts, yes. But you've also got social impacts that need to be mitigated as well, and and I don't know if it's if it's too much a shifting of blame, but we do, you know, the due diligence studies when we do look at at divesting from a specific operation, and you need to take the 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 whole process into account. So you, you think twice before you decommission a mine completely because you think about the community that will be yes. affected. Yeah, I think you know we've learned from that going forward. If you look at the two mines that, that are running in South Africa, Venetia mine up in, in the Limpopo area, the mine accommodation is in Messina, which is 80 kilometers away from the mine. Now, surely it would have been easier to create a mine town next to Venetia mine. 
However, you sit again with that legacy. Mm. You sit again with a community right next to the mm. mine. Kronstadt and Voorspoort is exactly the same. Voorspoort is around 40 kilometers outside of Kronstadt. So the company has taken it on itself to look at, from a social investment point of view, let's, let's look at the areas in which our labor sending would come from, and we look at developing those areas as well. It's, a, it's, it's maybe what uh, Governor just said uh, demonstrates that maybe one of the reasons we haven't made much progress, I mean, we're two weeks away from COP17 yeah. in South Africa, but we haven't made much progress because maybe we've moved the whole discussion on climate change into a silo and not looking at, at, at a more integrated, holistic linkages with society, mm -hmm. uh, with the economy. Mm -hmm. uh, would you say that that, that is maybe w the whole debate around climate change has now just moved us sort of off skelter and, and therefore we could fail because it's so isolated? I think, I think it has been in the, in the past that sustainable development climate change has been a, the, the thing on the side uh, away from your core business. Mm -hmm. um, um, but, but we have seen a change in that over the last few years. Uh, I guess the pressure of COP and the expectations is, is sort of is, is perhaps driving that, that, that question that um, you know, we're two weeks away and, and there's still uh, not, not clear out, out understanding of the outcomes of COP and what's got to happen there. Um, but I think business has tried to bring it into into the way they do business, basically. So it's not it's not this nice thing to have on the side. Um, but COP is about government negotiations, uh, not about business. Yeah, but mm. you know, um, uh, parallel to the uh, official COP sessions mm. of government within a certain precinct, business of, the, I think, the fifth or the sixth mm. are organizing their yeah, own sort there's of... There's lots of events and exhibitions going on. Yeah, yeah. No, no, totally agree. But the actual core of COP is, is government negotiations um, mm. behind closed doors. But we'd also say that uh, government negotiations are at the point where they're at because of the lobbies that, could, that have come out of business. Mm. Yeah. I mean, but lobbies have pushed certain governments, are, are Saudi Arabia, for example, mm. into a certain position yeah. uh, to fund certain lobbies. So as much as business is, is meeting on, on the side, mm. it, it sometimes happens mm. that what we find is that the government delegations are only going as far as business lobbies have actually given them string to go. Uh, mm. uh, but it's, it, I, th I, think, uh, I think these are the challenges mm. when you look at the whole integrating of climate change uh, into the whole business model mm. of how you do business and how business does business sustainably. Yeah. Yeah. I think yeah. if I can comment on that, I think one of, the, one of the crucial areas of that is if you see climate change in a silo, I think you run the risk of, of isolating it. Um, mm you isolate your initiatives. I think one of the areas De Beers has been, been very successful in is, we, yes, we have mining footprints, but if I have a look at the, the size of the conservation areas and the nature reserves that is owned by De Beers, it far outweighs the size of our mining areas. I think we have around 230,000 hectares which we've put aside for conservation areas. And, and not only conservation areas, but it looks at tourism, it looks at at how do you shift your focus away from mining mm. to sustainable community initiatives as well as you know the, the growth from, from a community or yeah. a social perspective. Gavin, looking at some of the stories that come out from Gauteng specifically in Johannesburg because yes. of uh, gold mining and you can't mine gold without mining uranium mm. as a byproduct. Yeah. It's creating a big problem with regards, regards to the water table and there's, very, there's a lot of concerns. We're talking about acid mine drainage and it's destroying our water table. Uh, when you see what mining companies actually need to do, gold mining companies, platinum companies, you look at the profits and the uh, incentives that people have felt because of the, mi because of the mining industry in, in South Africa relative to the rehabilitation costs down the line. Put it into monetary perspective for us. Does the one far outweigh the devastating effects of the other? Because you can't have a zero impact. Um, you are yeah. going to leave a scar no matter where you go. And Indeed. legacy issues have created this in the gold mining industry, for example. Yeah. You know, I think where, where the risk comes in is, is environmental impacts are difficult to sort of scope, if I can put it like that. Mm -hmm. You know, you, you, you don't see the immediate impact. It's not, for example, safety. Safety, you see a fatality, or you see a lost time injury. Environmental impacts are difficult to, to understand. And often they only surface many, many years after a mine has closed or a mine has reaped the benefits for you know, the extraction of a specific resource. From a monetary point of view, legacy will cost this country a lot of money. How much do you think? Have you given I, it a thought? I, I, I don't <laughs> think I'll hazard a guess at that, <laughs> but I'm, I'm honest, it's, it's, it's huge amounts of money. And, you know, I don't know if we've, we're in a position to, 
to be able to give a figure to the amount of, mm. of impact that mines mm. have caused mm. Mm -hmm. throughout the country. But I mean, there's, there are estimates that uh, unless we invest in sustainable development, uh, which is inclusive of climate change and mitigating the impacts of climate change, uh, the impacts on GDP is going to be massive. Mm. Uh, mm. and it's going to lead to loss of jobs anyway. Yeah. Uh, I mean, doesn't this put governments in a, at, at a very se sensitive intersection on the choices it makes on regulation, on carbon tax, uh, but also on the leadership that could come out of, uh, out of business? Mm. It, it's, it is a very challenging position to be in for governments, and I think, and particularly at this point in time with, with the economic you know, crisis, uh, political mm. instability, you know, to get um, clear commitments and... and Consensus among governments is going to be very difficult at this point. You know, when, when climate change started and Rio started 20 odd years ago, we had economic stability, political stability. It was easy to, to make investments and make promises. We're in a very difficult time at the moment, but it is a short term thing. At the end of the day, the recession will, yeah. will uh, reverse, will turn around. Um, and that's perhaps why it is more important now for business to take the lead whilst governments are in a difficult position. Do you think that it's, it's a collaboration between business and government down the line, uh, yeah, Jane? Because it sense, it, we sense that it's, a very, it's, it's a very politically driven yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah. I think, at I this think, stage. You know, things like COP are very politically driven and it's all about yeah. which bargaining um, point you're with. But, but I think the solution has to be a combination of governments, business and individuals yeah. to, to change cultures and change mm. behaviours. Last comments from you, Gavin, very quickly. You know, I think... We've, we've seen a shift, we've seen a change in the way businesses need to do their, their primary task, whether it be mining, whether it be industry. Mm. And I think what's, what's critical is, is to take climate change and to put it at the fore, to understand the business impact and the business risk climate change has. Okay. You, whether it shortens life of mines, whether it has an impact on water, whether it has an impact on increasing in temperatures where you know, certain things can't get to, to certain of the operations. Mm -hmm. And I think, you know, we need to, we need to proactively manage yeah. it. It's not, a, it's not a reactive process, mm -hmm. and it needs to take that into account. It needs to be yeah. proactive from now on. Proactive and not reactive. Thank you very much to Thank all you. of you for joining yeah. me. Great to have you on the program. On that note, we've come to the end of uh, this week's edition of Climate Change Perspectives. A big thank you to Gavin Anderson and Jane Mamet. Until next week, from me, Eleni Jokos and Daniel Kinnear, it's goodbye.